So up next, we have um, Felix Weigelt um, from Trump. Uh, he is a smart factory consultant. Um, <clears throat> so Felix, um, you know, with a passion for machines, Felix has been working uh, in the machine tool industry since he was a teenager. While growing up at the age, uh, at the edge of the Alps in Southern uh, Bavaria, Felix was eager to see the world. During college, uh, his studies led him to the Wind City. Uh, living in the Rust Belt of America exposed him to the manufacturing needs in an area of high labor costs and an uh, inevitable need for automation. While attending college in Chicago, Felix assisted one of his professors in consulting companies uh, across the Midwest regarding automation optimization projects uh, in, in various industries. In addition to that, throughout his studies, uh, Felix has been engaged with a world-renowned milling machine tool manufacturer that enabled him to work on a very uh, international basis on projects in Europe and North America. Eventually, this engagement gave Felix the opportunity to work and live uh, for a significant amount of time in Southeast Asia, specifically Sing uh, Singapore. After completing his, master completing his master's degree, uh, Felix decided to join Trump. Since 2016, Felix consults and advises fabricators across the Americas on how to optimize their manufacturing processes and techniques in the age of Industry 4.0. Uh, in this function, Felix has consulted more than 80 fabrication plants across North America uh, in leading and providing guidance to optimize fabrication processes. With that, I'd like to call Felix up to give his presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction. So a few words about Trump, uh, who doesn't know us. So Trump is we are the largest machine tool uh, manufacturer in the fabrication area, in the fabrication part of machine tools, right? Not so much milling. And we are the largest industrial laser manufacturer. Originally based in um, Germany, family-owned business, around 15,000 employees. We are also headquartered in North America here in, in Farmington, Connecticut, uh, where we have around 12, uh, 1,200 um, employees. And we started this, this journey of Industry 4.0 and Smart Factories um, around five years ago. And the reason why we started it is actually because we are living in a new age, right? As we talked before, and before we go into that, I would like to talk a little bit about how did we get there, right? How did we get into this new age? So let's look at typical fabrication. So this is what we typically see in fabrication plants across North America. You see this gentleman there. He is separating parts manually out of a sheet of metal. And then he has to separate them. He has to grind them and he has to sort them and has to put different work papers with the parts and has to put the skeletons that we see there, how we call those over there. So it's very labor intensive, right? Very good. Sorry, friends.
Very good. So, so we see here, right, very busy for this gentleman. He has to separate parts manually. It is very complicated. And also it's very complicated on a thinking level because you have to assign different orders that can be for completely different customers, right? Flexible sheet metal fabrication, low lot sizes. Therefore, it is very flexible. And therefore, my order sizes and the customers that I nest together, it's very complicated. And this is really something we see everywhere in North America, everywhere in the world when you fabricate parts. And when we look at that, this is how it typically looks like um, on a material flow basis. So you see your laser machines that are right here. I will show them right here. Here we see our laser machines. And over here we see our bending machines. So we first cut the part out of the sheet metal and then we bend it. And that is very messy. And so that is where we really have to look at an optimized way on doing that. And why are we doing that in the age of Industry 4.0? The Biggest reason why we are doing this is we did a study together with the Fraunhofer Institute where we looked at how much time are we spending in fabrication on actually making parts? How much time are we spending on value-added tasks? And when we do that, it came out, we did around 50 companies um, worldwide, that only around 50, around 20% is actual fabrication. I'm actually making parts. I'm adding, adding value to a part. The remaining 80% are all indirect processes, but not indirect processes that are happening in an office. Those are indirect processes happening on a shop floor, right? And so this is really crucial. And because of that, we really need to try to optimize that and increase the 80%, right? And um, decrease the 80% and increase the 20%. Yeah, so we are more efficient and we are making more parts in order to remain competitive. When we look back in the early stages of um, manufacturing, right, and I always like to bring this up because it shows us how we really started um, with making things. And one example I always try like to go back on is the automotive industry. Here we see one of the very early car manufacturers. So early um, when cars were introduced, we had all of those coach builders that were making before wooden carriages for horses, and then they transformed to making automobiles. And that's why at the turn of the century, you see so many different automotive manufacturers that just basically bought engines and then they put them on a, on a vehicle and built a car. And the reason why most of those companies failed is because they adopted the same manufacturing technologies as they did when they were building coaches and building buggies when they were making cars. You see it here, all on wooden horses, right? It's very simple. And you had a high level of customization. You could have any type you want, right? The Great Gatsby is a, is a famous um, book and movie. And very often you see this, this coach-built vehicle there, right? That is really what this all was about, right? You order a car, it's very custom. But the manufacturing technologies were terrible, right? Because your profitab profitability wasn't very high. And so that is really where Henry Ford came around, right? And he built his famous T model that you could have in any color as long as it's black. And you could order it on the assembly line at his Belarus plant in Michigan. And it really revolutionized things, right? And the interesting thing is now when you look at an automotive assembly line, you have a high level of flexibility, right? So it's even that different cars, there could be an SUV and a car, all manufactured in the same assembly line because we have this high level of flexibility now, all enabled through the PLCs, through the live data at the machines. However, and this is now where we go back to fabrication, right? Automotive, high, high volume, high volume, right? Tesla may, may be making 10,000 Model 3s a week, right? High, high volume. When we look in fabrication, where somebody makes a sheet metal part that is, we use a laser and a bending machine, you're at 10,000 per year, maximum. If you're beyond this 10,000, 15, 20, you stamp it. It's the cheaper process, right? So in that world of high flexibility, you have a very, very low lot size. And this is why automation with those low lot sizes, that is the most challenging. That's why an automotive assembly line, you can automate, automate the heck out of it because you always make the same part, right? And that is why it's so easy. And that's why we've seen the adoption of robots so early. And one thing that we see with our companies and our customers is that the complexity is further increasing. So that means whereas in the past, we had a 
very large lot size. Now we see how the lot sizes are even getting smaller for our customers. So that may mean that you maybe get an order for five pieces. You maybe get an order for 10 pieces. Hard value per piece, maybe $10, right? So it really goes down to low lot sizes. I would say the typical lot size is probably around 80 to 100 pieces that you make of this particular product. Maybe it becomes a repeat order, so you make it more often. But you really see how to automate that is very challenging. And this here is one of the very early pictures um, of um, robots being used in an assembly line, in this case, actually painting. And the thing that I think is the most interesting about this picture is that we have the robots, they're doing the work, but we have people that are looking at the process, right? They're observing, they're looking, what is the, the robot doing? Is it, is it painting? What is it really doing? Because we didn't trust the robots that much back then, right? So that's why now you don't have anyone watching robots, especially not on the shop floor, right? That'd be crazy. And if we look at robotic technology today, and I think this is really the crucial point is we are now also entering a new age. So we see over here, this beautiful KUKA control, um, very difficult. Those robots, right, to program them, you have to program them point to point, very labor intensive, especially now if you're in the fabrication world and you make this piece maybe 80 times, 100 times, no way I can automate that, right? It is not worth it because the programming, teaching it point to point is so difficult and it's so labor intensive. On the, on the right, we see now a more universal robot that I can teach by just moving it between two spots. In this particular case, we're doing a welding application. So he has here a little button that he pushes and says, okay, I wanna weld from here to here. Therefore I learn, okay, here's your starting point. Here's your end point and moves the robot manually. And that is all he needs to do to teach it how to move. So you really see how we're reaching a new age, right? We are going away from being on the control panel of the robot, teaching, writing G code, to going completely away that I teach it like this through teaching um, by moving it. Or I go into a world when I'm talking about bigger robots where the algorithms will actually write the code for the robots. Let me show you one example. So this is our um, programming software where we're now making a bending program for a bending robot of this particular part. A few clicks and this is all real time in the software. And you see the algorithm in just a few clicks has wrote the NC code for the robot and the vending machine. Now we can do some adjustments, how we want to pick up the part and where we want to deposit it. And that is then really it. Now I can take the part, can look at all of my bending steps and now send it directly onto the machine tool. And I can start bending the part. And that is really now where this enables us to bring robots in flexible sheet metal fabrication, low lot sizes, because now finally it's possible that the software writes the code for the robot as well as the machine. Yeah, so real game changer, right? And you see, you have a nice um, display, how it shows it to you, and then it deposits the part. And now going back to industry 4.0, um, when we look at integrated cutting and bending and at part separation, this is one crucial enabler. So when you cut a part, you typically cut it in a blank sheet metal five by 10 sheet. And as you cut it out, you then cut it and then you have to take it out and separate it. That is the most difficult part in the process because it is very difficult to take this part out because you have Again, low lot sizes, different geometries, it changes all the time. Since over 20 years, we are able to do that with, in a punching world, but we never really have been able to do it in the laser world in low lot sizes. And this has really changed with a new machine that we developed over 15 years. Trump prides itself of being a very um, development and R&D driven company. So we developed this machine tool for 15 years. We had over 25 prototypes that we built. We are well in the three digit million value in R and D costs in this, but it is the first time that we have a machine that has fully um, flexible and fully reliable part separation. That we have companies and customers out in the field that run this machine 
in the OEE level around the clock in the 85, 90%, but around the clock, including the weekend, right? So that is, that is absolutely outstanding. And this development on a cutting side, where we have now this fully reliable part separation, as well as on the bending side, where we now have very nice programs that can write for the robot the G-code, brings us to this comparison here. You see on the left, the automotive industry, and you see on the right, the fabrication industry. And because fabrication is so much different, so much, I would almost say in some ways, much more difficult because you have lower lot sizes, you see how the development is slower. But now we are reaching that new age where we can now have integrated cutting and bending solutions. And this is so important when it comes now to Industry 4.0, because what means integrated cutting and bending? It means essentially that you combine your two processes, the cutting process and the bending process. You remember we had this, this at the beginning where we had the different guys moving from cutting to bending the parts over. That now we can automate. Where we don't have somebody moving parts anymore from cutting and bending, we have a system in between that can transport it automatically. A standard system, not a custom system. A standard system out of the box that we can just implement anywhere. Oh, that's a little bit loud. I will reduce that here. So that really brings us then to the future of laser cutting. And so to enable that, also the machine needs to capture data um, that it then uses and it then analyzes that data to really optimize the cutting process. Here we see part of the part separation, which then allows us to really have a new process that is really autonomous and really allows us autonomous machine cutting. And then really have a machine that yep, changes how we do fabrication. What does this mean? So now when we talk about connecting those processes, on the left, you have all of the different cutting machines and those cutting machines can separate the parts reliably out of the sheet. On the right, you have different bending machines. Both of those bending machines that I'm showing here, the programming fully a few clicks in the software. So really for low lot sizes. In the center now, you have a tower system. And this is very important. The tower system becomes very important because here we have the different options. All we show them all here. The tower system becomes so important because there's now a setup how it could look like because of the different process times. Going back to automotive, right? Automotive, always the assembly lines, they're perfectly optimized in most cases where we cut apart, we make a part, right? We put it on a car and all of the techs are perfectly organized. For them, it's no problem, right? They always make the same car. Tesla will make another Model 3 just right now, right? So it's always the same processes. In fabrication, always different parts, right? So just taking a cutting machine, I put a conveyor belt and then I put a bending machine, that won't work, right? Because the processes, the cutting process will always be different as the bending processes, right? The times always change. And so this is what a traditional system looks like that's interlinked. So you have a tower system, then you have a cutting machine, then a bending machine. You always have the problem that now if you're bending, as we show here at six minutes apart, and I'm cutting at three minutes apart, the cutting machine will always be sitting idle because my bending machine takes too long. Especially if I'm in a flexible environment, I have parts that change all the time, not possible. And that is really where the tower system comes in. Because contrary to the other industries, in our industry, batch processing is really crucial. I want to maximize the output of each individual capital asset to its maximum. And that's why we do the batch processing, and this is enabled to the tower system. And so the tower system, here we see it, <clears throat> this is a small one. It essentially is an inventory system that knows how much stock it has of finished parts of raw material feeds that back to an MES <clears throat> and is all connected to an MES system that gives us live feedback on where which part is. And also on top of that live feedback to an ERP system where we then can directly basically look at the parts, which ones are coming down, which ones do we have to make next, et cetera. So it's a really modern um, automated way of doing things. 
And this brings us to this video here. So here we now see the automated um, cutting and bending and how we take the parts out. And we sort the parts on those pellets. And now they're being brought back into a storage system. The storage system stores them. And now they come back out. And our bending machine, the ones that I showed you earlier, where we made the program automatically, starts bending the part. All of course with live, live data, MES system in the background. And now my part is finished and I can now directly move on um, to the next process. And so really industry 4.0 at its finest, right? And we are executing many of those different systems. Um, at the moment across North America, we have um, installations that go into probably around 20 installations in North America at the moment that have that full integrated cutting and bending. Tower systems, we are well in the, in the um, 250 across North America. So you see it's a really um, complex, um, but a really uh, environment where our fabrication industry is moving to. Yeah. Especially in right now, we see as with COVID, many people have retired and have left the workforce. We have less people coming back. And especially in markets like South Dakota, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Iowa, those are really the markets where we see a lot of demand for those systems because limited labor pool, costs are going through the roof, and your um, unemployment rates are, in most cases, almost zero. So that's really why, why we see a huge demand for that. And that really then changes our world, right? Industry 4.0, how we are making parts. You see on the left, our operator, right? That's the current state in still many cases. He is the process owner. He separates parts. He does whatever he does next. He decides what he makes next almost. Somebody may come and scream at him, hey, you do this next. But he knows how oh, this part is easier. So when that person walks away, he makes this part, right? <laughs> so that's the, the natural environment. And in the future, we're really going into a system control engineering level. We are literally removing the operator from the shop floor. We have those engineers that are running the machines, basically. And this then goes into more detailed discussions on how you now can have different service models that, for instance, you could say, okay, now um, as part of the machine, we offer you um, a contract where we will make sure that the machine is, when it stops, we will restart the machine remotely, right? So many interesting things that go into that new world of industry 4.0 and the new world of smart factories. And if you would like, you're more than welcome to visit us at our smart factory in Chicago, out of which I'm based off. Um, this is a small picture of that smart factory there. We really showcase that fully integrated manufacturing technology. This is a working factory where we basically cut and bend parts for our customers that we then deliver from there to North America, to any customer in North America, um, just to really showcase what the technology can do. And I think this is everything that I had so far. So thank you very much. And I think then we go into the panel discussion.